Hi all, thank you for joining my channel today. Now the time has come where I finally talk about something other than Flat Earth. Today we're going to talk about something even cheerier, the destruction of Earth and possibly life as we know it. Now, just like the Earth being a sphere, climate change is one of those topics where intelligent people are still wondering why the hell we are still talking about this. Surely we have demonstrated that it's a very real thing. In this video, I'll be talking a bit about climate change and showing how we know that carbon dioxide emissions are causing the temperatures to change. Now, I'll do this using publicly available data from locations uh, shown on screen, and the links will also be in the description. Firstly, we start with a very crude model which relates carbon dioxide to temperature. This is a differential equation which has the solution of T as a function of C is equal to A times the natural log of carbon dioxide concentration plus B, where A and B are constants of proportionality and integration respectively. We are going to test this model on the data we have gathered from the different sources. First, we have the average temperature deviation for each year, which is plotted on the left-hand side. Temperature deviation is here defined as the difference in temperature of a year and the average temperature in 1960. On the right-hand side, we have the average carbon dioxide concentration for each year. Now, we see that both are increasing with time, and we see that we have a few anomalies in the carbon dioxide data, which is likely due to a measurement fault, so we will remove these. Now to test our model, we can plot the temperature deviation against carbon dioxide concentration and we do a least squares fitting of the model on the data to get our fitting parameters. A very basic analysis of the residual showed that this is a reasonable fit. Now there are more sophisticated and more correct methods to test the fit, but this video is already getting a bit too technical. So now we've established the relationship between carbon dioxide and temperature, we can stick our model on the plot of temperature against time and we still find a pretty good fit we can add some ice core carbon dioxide measurements to test the model for time before 1960. And this is an okay fit, but not as good. Now this is likely because the ice core data is smooth and I am too lazy to pull together all the raw data sets. Now overall, it is pretty reasonable to conclude that carbon dioxide and temperature are correlated, but we must be good scientists because correlation does not mean causation. Now we can say that carbon dioxide increases temperature, but we could also say that temperature increases carbon dioxide. So we have to consider possible mechanisms for this relationship. We don't really have to look far. First we take the greenhouse effect. Uh, what happens is that shortwave radiation is absorbed by the ground and then re-emitted as longwave radiation or infrared radiation. This radiation is then absorbed by carbon dioxide and re-emitted again isotropically. That is to say, half of it goes up and half of it goes back down. Now the radiation that goes up can be absorbed by another carbon dioxide molecule and then will be re-emitted and half of that goes back down again. Provided that the downward radiation is not absorbed by another carbon dioxide molecule, it is absorbed by the ground to be emitted upwards again for more absorption by carbon dioxide. So here we run into the first common objections from climate change deniers. They will say that a concentration of only 400 parts per million is tiny and that there's no way that this could have a significant effect. Well, first, a graph would argue, it clearly does. And also secondly, the notion that 400 parts per million is too small a concentration to have an effect is really stupid. For example, take red chilies. The capsaicin concentration in a red chili is about four times smaller, yet you still taste the capsaicin. You still notice this even when you put a tiny bit of chili in your food, when the concentration is even smaller. Or you could try inhaling 100 parts per million of carbon monoxide for an extended period of time. What will happen is that you will get a bit sleepy, and then you will end up taking a nap. For a very long time. So in case you didn't catch the sarcasm, do not try this at home, it will kill you. And just in case you really didn't get the point, consider epinephrine or adrenaline. The concentration required to treat hypertension in infants is orders of magnitude smaller. Yes, a concentration which is almost 40,000 times smaller will save a child's life. But let's move on to the other possible mechanism. And this is the notion that increased temperature results in increased carbon dioxide concentration. Now, one example of this is permafrost melting. As temperature increases, the permafrost melts and releases carbon dioxide. So, yes, that mechanism exists as well. So, carbon dioxide and temperature 
are correlated and there exist causal links for both explanations of this observation. This means that there's a feedback loop which is really troubling. So our first interim conclusion is simple. We are screwed. Of course, we then have to question whether the increase in carbon dioxide is due to human activity. We can do this qualitatively by just looking at ice core data from the past millennium. Here we see that there's a massive increase in carbon dioxide concentration starting in the 1800s. Now let's blow this one up and annotate this with some historical events. Pretty much from the start of the Industrial Revolution, carbon dioxide levels have started rising. Now why would that be? Could it be industrialization? So, yes, human activity really is to blame for the rise in carbon dioxide. So, update to our interim conclusion is that we are really screwed and it is entirely our fault. Now, climate change deniers will inevitably come up with some stuff around historic fluctuations in temperature and carbon dioxide concentration. And they'll say, yeah, it's always been fine. Now, this is true, but only because these fluctuations happened over millions of years, not a few decades because geological and evolutionary processes can adjust for these fluctuations, but not quickly. Then there will always be a flimsy argument around the Earth being able to deal with excess carbon dioxide and ramble some shit about the carbon cycle and balance. So let's actually have a look at the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle describes how carbon is absorbed by plants through photosynthesis or sequestered and then released through natural processes. But we are messing up this cycle. Factories and cars are pumping more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere without boosting nature's ability to deal with this added carbon dioxide. In fact, we are making it worse through deforestation. Pumping carbon dioxide into the atmosphere may not be such a horrible thing if we boosted nature's ability to deal with it, but we are stripping away nature's ability to handle it and we are creating a big problem. But water vapour. Now, water vapour is a far more significant contributor to the greenhouse effect. And, well, yes, this is true. But the water cycle is very fast and it's very adaptable. And I hope you understood from the previous slides that we are messing with balance. We are not really messing with the balance of the water cycle at all, actually. But, 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 but then methane. Now, I've never understood the climate change deniers argument with methane at don't understand what they're trying to say because yes methane is a serious greenhouse gas and yes we are increasing the levels of that one too now remember this guy livestock is pumping more methane into the atmosphere and as our meat consumption increases so does the amount of livestock and then also the methane emissions so we are really screwed and we are the only ones to blame now, there will be more arguments about adaptation and evolution and the Earth always finding some equilibrium state. Well, yes, as a species, we could adapt to the new environment because one of the fundamental traits of our species is that we are really clever and really adaptable, but we still rely on food and our food is stupid. It doesn't adapt so quickly. Evolution is a really slow process. Even artificial selection takes fucking forever. And when it comes to an equilibrium, you assume that this equilibrium gives a shit about humanity. All the other planets in the solar system are at an equilibrium. Now, try living there, I dare you. So, of course, there are some silly claims put out by climate change deniers. A big one generally revolves around an ice cube in a drink. When it melts, the levels don't rise. Uh, as the ice caps are floating in water, the levels shouldn't rise, as this is Archimedes' principle. Again, yeah, this is 100% correct, apart from ignoring the huge ice caps on Greenland and the Antarctic, which are not floating in water. Also, as the ice melts, the reflectivity of the Earth gets reduced. The Earth gets hotter and more carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere. So there is another feedback loop, which is really concerning. Oh, and of course, there's something about carbon dioxide being good for plants. Yeah, but you know what's not good for plants? Increased temperature and acid rain. Oh, and the whole deforestation thing. 
So anyway, this is my opening gambit around climate change. Uh, I am planning to do a series of videos on the topic where we will look at some of the mechanisms in more detail. However, in the meantime, check out all the other stuff that I've been doing on other topics. And apparently telling you to like and subscribe helps my channel. So yeah, go and do that.